I love weddings. I love everything about it. I love the anticipation, the design, the decor, the hustle and bustle, the bride. I just, the emotions. I love crying. I love those like where you want to tear up or you get chill bumps because of that song they're dancing to or something like that. Love weddings. But I didn't have a wedding because I had to hurry up and get married. So we got married in our attorney's office when we were signing paperwork to buy the quadruplex. (laughs) From Fiori Communications, it's How I Got Here, a show of inspiring stories from Tallahassee area leaders, business owners, and neighbors, all the challenges, opportunities, inspirations, the twists and turns of life that led them to where they are today. Everyone has a story worth telling, and I am really grateful that we get to bring a few of them to you. I truly have been changed by my conversations with these amazing people, and I'm confident you will be too. I'm Dave Fiore. In this episode, I speak with Terry Smith, owner of Terry Smith Details, a boutique party rental company known for transforming event venues into unique spaces. Terry is energetic, confident, and a whirlwind of ideas, which has helped her overcome challenges that include escaping Saigon, Vietnam with her family as a young child, living on her own at age 16, and waitressing her way through college, a decision she actually regrets. I started the conversation by asking her to describe herself today. I'm very confident. I'm the type of person that will jump out of a plane and figure out how the parachute works on the way down. I'm not indecisive. I am yes or no. I'm not gray. I'm black or white. I make decisions really fast and I stick to it. And as I'm working on the decisions, if I realize this is not working or it's not bringing in enough revenue, I can stop and go, okay, this isn't working. Let's switch. So I guess the one thing I would say is I'm very confident in my abilities. Okay. And if I don't have the correct skill set, I will hire someone that does. That's and always I, smart. I, I prefer to hire smarter people than me. Right. I got that advice a long time ago. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Yes. And honestly, it's the best thing you can do. You were born in Saigon, Vietnam, right? Which is now known as Ho Chi Minh City. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, so you and your siblings came to America at the time of the fall of Saigon. How old were you at that time? It, it's a little blurry, and I and I really wasn't able to discuss it much with my dad because I could tell it, like, hurt. Mm. You could see the hurt in his eyes. But um, I was either five or six when we got here. I'm thinking I was fi- five, and I turned six, like, the week of. Because one of the, my favorite, favorite memories is um, Thanksgiving morning, our first Thanksgiving morning in America. My dad woke me up, and my birthday is November Um, 23rd. So either it was my birthday or it was like the next day or something. Thanksgiving always fell around my birthday. My dad woke me up and he said, Terry, wake up, come look at the TV. I've never even seen TV before. So it's the Macy's Day Parade, just all these colors and everybody. And he's like, look, they're celebrating your birthday. (laughs) And I was like, wow, how did they know? America's so great. (laughs) That's a great dad thing to do, right? Oh my gosh, it was the best. Take advantage of Mm -hmm. it. That's awesome. So do you remember, I mean, when I think of the fall of Saigon and people jumping onto helicopters as the capital falls, were you in any kind of dramatic, do you remember anything yes, about it? Yes, that, that is one memory I definitely do remember. Um, so my dad married my mom, and with my mom, he had four kids. He also adopted her, her kids from a previous marriage. Her first husband died in the war, and she had two kids. So there were six kids my dad and my mom. And I remember where we were staying. For some reason, our luggage was always by the front door. And my dad would come home. He's like, not today. You know, I wasn't, I just wow. wasn't sure. I just remembered the look. And then one day he came home and it was crazy mad. We were running around, putting stuff in the luggage, more stuff, grabbing it and rushing out. And I remember going to a big, big airport because my dad at that time, he'd already left the um, Air Force and he was a civilian in um, Vietnam because he wasn't going to leave his family. Right. But we got to the airport and I remember, like, I guess we were going through everything to get onto the plane and we were just about to walk onto the plane when I turned around and there's like 15 people running towards us, all in uniforms. And they grabbed my little brother. So he's a year younger than me. So I was probably five and he's four. 
but they grabbed my brother and they pulled off the boots he was wearing to make sure there was nothing in it. I know, reali- I realize now it's like- they're What would have been in the boots? Bombed, a bomb. Oh. So we're getting on a plane. So they didn't check, for some reason, they didn't check his boots and they grabbed him. He was crying. I was like scared, but you know, there was no bomb in it and we put it back on and we got on the plane and- I didn't realize at the time, but my dad told me later how worried he was that they were going to get shot down, that we were going to get shot down. The, once you were in the air. Yeah. But I just remember having a great time because there were stewardess on the plane. It was a commercial plane, and they gave us little toys to play with. So the whole plane ride to, I think we went to Germany first, and then Germany to Paris or London, and then to America. I mean, you know, you're five or six. Mm-hmm. You probably really had no idea that you, were, you weren't going to come back. I... I I don't have it. Yeah, you're correct. I don't remember anything except that I was with my dad and I was with my mom and my family. That's right. that, That's all I cared about. Yeah. And where do you fall in the in the sibling list? Where in what order? Oh, where are you? I'm my mom's third child and my dad's first. Okay. So you you come to America and you end up in Moultrie, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And a, and Moultrie is actually the big town. We actually lived in the outskirts of Moultrie in an even smaller town okay. called Funston. Funston. And uh, yeah, so we would go to Moultrie on the weekends every weekend for groceries and stuff. And it was like about a 20, 20 minute drive. <laughs> okay. So how did you end up in Funston? Um, my dad's family, my my dad's mom lived there and we moved in with her. Okay. And he brought everybody. He, someone said, yeah, he brought all of Vietnam over into this really like small country town. They've never seen Asians before. Mm. We were the first, even though I'm only half Asian. <laughs> but Obviously not from Funston. Right, exactly. Right. So you're the oldest at five or six of the of your mom and dad's children. Right. Mm-hmm. What kind of job did he get in, in that area? I remember the best job he had. My dad and his brother opened up a grocery store in, I think it was Moultrie. And we would go and we would be able to get all kinds of snacks and candies. <laughs> and I just remember loving that. But I guess it didn't go well because they shut down. And then my dad... Um, when he was in the Air Force in Vietnam, he was a mechanic on the plane. So he's very mechanical, which right. that's pretty much probably where I get it from, too. But he um, started working for like uh, factories that created clothes, clothes like jeans or peanut butter. So he would work on the big equipments there. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So adju- you're adjusting to life in America. And as a kid that old, Probably doesn't really. There, there was no adjusting. Yeah, you're just kind of mm-hmm. where you live now. But right? I do remember um, not knowing a lot of English. And mm-hmm. I was uh, going to ask you if you were bilingual or how did that work. I was bilingual. Okay. <laughs> I spoke Vietnamese as my primary language and a little bit of English. But when we moved to America, my parents got divorced. Like I want to say, like six months later, mm-hmm. and uh, my dad raised me, so okay. I lost the ability to speak uh, Vietnamese. I mean, I know some stuff. Like uh, every summer, we'd go visit my mom, and it was you dirty dumb, you dirty dumb, you stink. Go take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting phrase to know. Yeah, yeah, because we heard it all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so then you end up you you live there until high school age, right? And then mm-hmm. you moved to Tallahassee. Yes, mm-hmm. I decided. Uh, Moultrie was too small for me, and my mom lived in Tallahassee, so I decided to go live with her. And you went to Godby? Godby, yep. Godby with you. Okay. <laughs> and um, what year were you in in high school when, when you moved? Um, must have been 84, 85. Oh, ninth grade. I went, when I got to Godby, it was like school had already been going on for two months, so I attended ninth grade after two months of already, they've already started school. Okay. And then I, I know that, I mean, you said you dropped out in your senior year to mm-hmm. work full time because um, you needed money to live. Right. I needed a place to stay. So, so that meant I needed income. Right. So you were not staying with your mom anymore? No. Nope. Okay. Yep. I was, I uh, believe I was 16, about to turn 17, and I needed a place to live. So this is where my confidence plays a big part mm-hmm. of me. I walked into... Um, at the time, it was called Mabry Village Apartments on Pensacola Street. I told them, hey, I need an application. My brother wants to live here. So they handed it to me. I went and filled it out, and I went back two days later, and I handed it to a different person. It's like, hey, my brother wanted me to drop this off, and here's his retainer and stuff like that. And they gave me the keys. Hmm. They weren't really doing background checks or nope, not verification at all. or anything. So I was, I think I was 16 when I got it, and I turned 17 um, when I was living there. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility for a 
a kid that age to live on their own, work full time. Did you consider going back to Moultrie? Was that an option or did you just decide you're here and you're going to make it on I your I could own? have always gone back with my dad, but I knew, and thanks to television, everyone's like, television's bad, but no, thanks to television, I knew how I wanted to live. Mm-hmm. Um, we grew up very, very, very poor. I mean, sometimes we lived on government cheese and it was good. But right. um, I knew that what I needed was money to live the way I wanted and to be able to help my family. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what kind of job did you get? What, what did you do? Actually, when I was in high school, I, um, there was a program called DCT. Mm-hmm. I do, I, they may still have that. But um, in the program, you could go to school and work. And right. I did that. I like worked in an in, office setting yeah. somewhere, mm-hmm. right? I worked in the library and got paid for it. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you like that? Uh, I liked, well, yeah, because I do like books, but it was a little bit slow because I'm very hyper. I need a lot of movement and (laughs) The library is not the most happening place in the world. But it it was great because it was a library at the school. And so I didn't need a car. I didn't need a car or anyone to take me to work back and forth. So I could work at school and then work uh, and then walk home. (laughs) So what did you do when you dropped out? What kind of job did you have? Okay, so I still didn't have a car. So it depended on people, which that makes my skin crawl when I think about it. Like, I, I, I'm I, not a big fan of asking, like, can you take me here? Mm-hmm. You know, other like that. Ugh. Anyways, so I got a job where um, it was cleaning offices at night. So, and best boss ever. I love him. I, and I still don't know how I got it or how I got connected with Conrad. But he would uh, pick me up like around three o'clock every day. And uh, me, him, and another girl would run around. We would do about 20 offices a night. Wow. Cleaning. And then he dropped me off. And and I, I got my GD. So I dropped out of high school and I was uh, getting my GD. And I worked for him for probably about a year. And I saved up $800 and bought my first car. Wow. <laughs> and then that what changed kind of car my was life. It? it was a like a, a baby blue Mustang, the older ones. Mm -hmm. Um, But yes, that changed my life. So, and I felt really bad because Conrad, he didn't want to lose me. Um, But I went and got a waitressing job and that totally changed my life because I was making so much money waitressing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it it taught me how to be very sociable. Um, Deal with people who are mm-hmm. happy and not happy. Yep. Right? And every day it was a challenge. Like uh, the restaurant I worked in, like there's, you know, there's always going to be people, regulars, and some you're going to love and some you don't. Well, there was one group that none of the waitresses liked. Like they would not take them. And so I took it on as a challenge, you know, right. because they never left a tip or a big tip. Mm. So I took it on as a challenge. So I would always take them and they would always leave me a big tip. <laughs> so what was the, what do you think you were doing differently? I probably didn't go in with that attitude like, oh, I'm not going to get a tip. Oh, I can't stand waiting on it. I went in like, you know what? Here's my chance. Here's my chance to sell myself. Let's see what happens. Right. And I'm very good at selling myself. <laughs> and it worked. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's great. So you went on to college, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Ended up getting two degrees. Yep. So tell me about that. Yes. Um, I got my two degrees from FSU. My first one was, uh, at the time, they call it MIS, but I don't think they call it anymore that anymore. It's called Management Information System. It's working with computers, programming, and stuff right. like that. It might be computer science now. Okay. But I got my MIS degree, and I also got my hospitality degree. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you have any idea at that time that, I mean, did you have an interest in those areas, or what led you to major in those two things? Oh, money. Money, money. And I know I probably sound shallow saying that, but when you grow up without money, mm-hmm. you don't want the feeling that it comes with, because I've seen my dad cry because he couldn't buy m- my shoes for me in fifth grade. And I never wanted him to ever be sad because he couldn't give me money for college or something, you know? And I, right. I never want the best present you can give yourself and your family is to be able to take care of yourself. That is the best present. And that's what I wanted for my dad. I never wanted him to worry for me. Right. And you said that you didn't ask him for any money through college and you did I'm very proud to say, yeah. I'm very, very, very proud to say that waitressing, I paid my own way through college. I didn't ha- I didn't get a single dime from anybody. I didn't ask for money. Um, I didn't any, get any grants and I didn't have any loans. Um, 
I was stupid. I should have applied for grants. But at the time, I was making so much money. I made more money waitressing than I did with my first job out of college, wow. working less. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did it all yourself, which – because I was going to ask you because – Grants would have been a good thing to have. Right. You don't I, have to pay those back. I wasn't around people that that discussed stuff like that, and I didn't have right. You parents. were just determined to do it yourself. No, right? it wasn't that. I, if I had known I could apply for some kind of grant, I just didn't think I could get it because I was making so much money. Hmm. I mean, I was making more than my friends who graduated college. So I was making so much money. I, I was living on my own. I bought a new car. I had car payments, and I was paying my – um tuition every semester and buy my books. So I was, and I had a lot of money left over. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So I was making a lot of money. So I really didn't think I would even could get a grant, yeah. but I know now I could have, right. and then I could have worked less, but I don't know if that would have been the case. Cause I mean, I was working three jobs sometimes and going to college. I made sure all my classes were on Tuesdays and Thursdays from like seven o'clock to 12. Like, I'd take all my classes on Tuesdays and Thursday, and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all I did was work. I know from your personality and from what you said that you seem like that would energize you, that you you enjoy the work, the challenge, but that had to wear you out at some point. That is, that's a lot of work. I'm, I'll be 50 in November, and I'm still so hyper, and I've got projects all the time I'm working on. Even my assistants who are all in college are like, Terry, oh my gosh. <laughs> What are you on? We want some. You know, I'm just always been like this. Right. After college, um, what happens then? What what do you keep waitressing? Do you look for another okay. job or what happens? Okay. So it was really hard to leave waitressing. Be but I knew Did you work I, in the same place the whole time when you waitressed? Um yeah. Yes. I worked well, I started off at Ryan's Steakhouse. Okay. And then someone told me about catfish pad, like how much money they were making. So I worked on catfish pad on Pensacola Street for like six years. Okay. And and when I was working there, I also like during the Christmas time when I felt like I needed more money and they were closed on Sundays. So I would go waitress at Quincy's on Sundays. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I was always working. Right. Mm -hmm. So you decide at some point after college you you're ready to leave waitressing and then Well where, I needed to go? because you need like waitressing you can't do it forever, as in, like, you need health insurance because health insurance was a big concern. And and probably not for me because I was so young, but that's all I ever heard. It's like, you know, health insurance. You need health insurance. You need you need benefits and this stuff. So I went and uh, let's see. After that, I went and worked for the state. Um, I, I did some programming for them, some languages there. And then not too long of that, I worked for a computer software company. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I did support for them, which was fun. It was a, a cubicle setting, and there was like 30 of, 30 of us, and we had our own specialty. And um, issues would come in on like this queue. Yeah. Uh, and we would take the issues, and we were able to dial into their computer and look at what's going on, fix it. So sometimes we didn't have to interact with people at all. Did you like that? I'm I mean, a, not, did you like the job overall? Yes, it was fun. It, oh, my gosh. I'll tell you, the biggest thing I learned from that was how to troubleshoot. Because sometimes, like, if something's broken, you just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But working that job, you end up having the ability to go, okay, let's break it down in small parts. Let's try this first. And then when you do that, you know, okay, this works like this. So we know it's not A, B, or C. So let's try this other scenario. Okay, it could be D or E. So, so gosh, that it gave me troubleshooting skills where I'm really fast now. If I'm at an event and something happens, my brain just automatically goes, how do I fix it? And I fix it. Right. And, and some of the biggest compliments I get was one time I was at a wedding, we were delivering rentals. And one of the interns helping one of the event planners used to like help me out and she goes oh my gosh cherry's here she'll know how to fix it <laughs> and i love that because i was like and i think that's where the engineering or mechanical part of my dad came in because i would watch him fix cars and learn all about cars and tools and stuff like that which was fun for me how did you get interested in photography and how, at what point did you think maybe you could do that for a living well i always love when growing up we had magazines, you know, magazines, newspapers, and I would always look at the pictures and I would love the pictures, but we couldn't afford a camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we had Polaroids, right. like a Polaroid camera, but we couldn't afford a camera. So I didn't get a camera. And um, when I got to college and I was making a lot of money, I bought myself a really nice um, SLR camera, you know, the kind where the lens actually comes off right. and you can yeah. switch out lens. We and, would call that a real camera. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, I purchased that and I t- signed up for some like fun electives, like on the side at FSU, um, learning how to uh, develop and print. Right. It didn't really teach you the camera, but I learned the darkroom. Right. And so. So for our listeners under 40 years old, <laughs> that, uh, there weren't, there weren't, some, you didn't have digital cards. You actually had film and had to develop it. And that was a real skill, right? The darkroom skill. Mm-hmm. That's a real part of the deal, especially the, for black and white. Right. right. And the chemical smells and. Yeah. Yeah. And you're alone in there and might be two or three other people there and everyone's in their own world. And. But it's it, kind of a cool process. It right? is. It really is to, to see how it worked. Oh Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I, you started I, to get mm-hmm, fuel I, that interest. Yes. And um, okay, so I was in college and and so I was doing that and then, you know, left college. So I still played with my camera. And actually I was really getting into it and I was about to um by this time I'd purchased a house and I was gonna make the spare bathroom into a, a dark room. And I had been dating my now husband, who was my boyfriend then, for two weeks. And he bought, he changed my life. He changed my life. He bought me a digital SLR. So here's this really expensive and fancy camera where I could take a picture and I could immediately see if I liked the image. And if I didn't like it, I could go and Google why it didn't do what I wanted. I I didn't know that, you know, it's called death of field or bokeh. I just said, how to make the background fuzzy, you know? (laughs) And that's what I did. I would get on there and it, And then it would start talking about that. And I was like, ooh, ooh, let me try this then. And so it changed my life. It changed my life. Him purchasing, because I was going to still do film and have a dark room. But believe me, I learned so much in one day with that digital camera because I was able to, I don't like this picture. What's wrong? Why is this picture so dark? I Google, fix it, go out, try it again, and keep doing it. I know. And it's funny because... It really is hard to think back to the time where you can't take a picture and just look at it immediately. Mm-hmm. It's just amazing how much that's changed. So now, so instantly you're being able to to learn faster, correct what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Does that help you kind of develop your eye and kind of figure out kind of your photography style maybe? Well, I'll have to say like I, I feel like my eye and my composition was started earlier on by looking at magazines. Because mm-hmm. I would look at a magazine when I was a little kid and go, why do I like this picture so much? Is it because the girl's looking at me, you know, or is it because she's looking away or the background? Like, is it, it's a clean background. It's not cluttered. I remember. And then I go, oh, that's so cool how she's looking away and she's all the way on the edge. Like, that's not that shouldn't be. I just remember thinking about these pictures. And so I kind of had a feel for what I wanted. I love symmetry and I love left negative space. So I remember looking at those pictures and going, why do I like this? It's like, oh, I'm walking down an aisle because it was symmetrical. Right, right. So, so that style started with me already. So I started taking pictures of little kids or, um, you know, kids of my family or something, you know, friends and stuff. And uh, then their friends would see it and they're like, hey, will you do ours? And then I started charging. And then um, I had a friend who um, wanted me to do her wedding. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's scary. That's memories. <laughs> well, you just, don't want to mess that right. up. Right. She's like, just show up with the camera. You don't have to give me anything. And thank goodness she got married at the beach because you can't take a bad picture there. <laughs> right. I remember Lighting was, is always good there. Oh, my gosh. I remember it was October and I drove home that night. It was Saturday and I woke up Bruce, my husband. I go, guess what? I'm going to be a wedding photographer. <laughs> had no clue how what I was going to do. But I l- had loaded those pictures and I was in love with the emotions, the feeling, the I could still see it now. Just, it was amazing. And uh, I woke him up. Just like I said, I jump out of that plane bef- and figure out how the parachute works on the way down. And the next day I started my photography business. So were you weddings. still working a regular job at yes, that point? Yes. Yes. I was working uh, 40 hours a week at the software company. But once that little got into my head, oh my gosh, every day was great. Every day at work was great. Because I didn't sat down and go, gave myself a one-year plan. I said, in one year, I will have enough money saved in the bank where if for some reason this photography thing doesn't work, I've got enough money saved up where I can go back into the, you know, eight to five world. 
Right. How did that first wedding go? The first real one? Yeah. Yes. It was amazing. It was awesome. I was a little nervous, but I'm pretty confident in myself. And I'm one of those that I will research and research. And again, I'm a great troubleshooter. So it went really well. And I once I started doing weddings, I did three my first year. My second year, I did 30. Wow. So from word of mouth or how, a how blog. did that grow? Back then, blogs were kind of new. Mm. So I started a blog. Um, for Terry Smith photo. And uh, my whole thing was instant gratification. So if I shot your wedding Saturday, Tuesday, I would have like four pictures up on the blog. And then Friday, I would have a slideshow of mm. like probably 30 pictures to music. And then also, I, I, I took a workshop up in Atlanta by an amazing photographer named Zach Arias. And his whole thing was uh, using flash. And I you know, I love the natural light, and I wasn't good at flash, but I was bound and determined to get good at it. So I went in there, and he shot. He, he taught us how to do backlighting with a flash. And I did it for one wedding because I was scared of the lighting. I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. They're about to cut the cake, and it's pitch black out here. And I'm going to have to have a flash on my camera. It's going to be hideous. It's going to look like everybody here with their point-and-shoot camera. <laughs> right. And I said, I can't do that. It was at Pebble Hill, and it was Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Um <laughs> They were getting ready to cut the cake. There was no roof to bounce the light off. There was not a wall for me to bounce the light off of. So I grabbed a, um, a server. I said, hey, do me a favor. Just hold this light. I want you to crouch down um, on the opposite of, side of me. The cake is going to be right between us. Just point this flash at the cake. Stay down low so I don't see you. Just point the flash at the light. And I took the shot, the very first one I saw on the back of my camera, and I was like, my jaw dropped. It yeah. was so good. How good it the looks. lady yeah. standing um, next to me saw the back and she goes, oh my God. And that's how the magic shot was invented. So I had, I labeled it the magic shot and every wedding I would do the magic shot. And from that first wedding or probably that was the second wedding. And that's how I got 30 weddings the next year. Wow. Mm -hmm. everybody, everybody wanted the magic shot. Right. And I was the only one that was doing it. And then I taught a lot of my photographer friends, and now everyone does Everybody's it. That's got fine. The magic shot. I, I go on to something bigger and better. Right. Because, I mean, photography lighting is a very technical thing, right? I mean, to, to understand how it all works, that's pretty amazing that you just kind of did it and it worked. Well, I, I had taken that class. Right. And I remembered a little bit. And I really think, like, that shot, I don't know how it worked right, but it did. And I'm very, very happy it did. But I also went ahead and had them stop and I took regular shots just to CYA. Yeah. But that was the one shot that everybody wanted. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So yes, you're right. If I really think about it, lighting and using flashes is technical, but it kind of came naturally to me because I had the beginning steps, the basics, I guess. And once I had the basics, I built on that. Hey, everybody. Just a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by Fiori Communications. Just like people, every business has a story to tell, and we've been helping our clients tell their story since 2001, because who you are as a company is just as important as what you do. To learn more about how telling your story can make a difference in your business, visit FioriCommunications.com. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. All right, we're going to come back to the the wedding stuff and where that evolved to, but I want to stop a minute, talk about your husband Bruce, how you met, and Diva um, Bruce, and <laughs> tell me about him. I love him. He, I call it, his nickname is Diva Bruce because he likes to finer things in life. <laughs> like what? Uh, and he, and the more expensive, the more he likes it. Okay, we've been only dating six uh, two weeks when he bought me a three thousand dollar camera. That that's a nice present for. And this was that stage this of was about fifteen what fifteen sixteen years ago. Right. These, well, I was going to say you had to be in the early end of digital photography, oh, yes. and that stuff is not cheap. Yes, yes, it. You're right because at the time everybody's like they were going digital, and I was like, oh, I'm never going to go digital. I'm just going to go film. I didn't ask for it. He just shows up with it because he likes tech. He likes technical gadgets and stuff like this, and he likes spending and he money must on it. He liked you too. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I. You know what? I don't go out on a date unless I know I'm going to marry you. So I've only had like three boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good standard, actually. Don't waste time, right? Uh, oh, see, yep. yes, I've. 
that was my thing. I was like, I'm not one to like date, to hope to like you. I will go on the date if I already know I like you and I'm pretty sure we're going to get married. So what was it about Bruce that you liked? Well, this is funny. Um, so I was dating an older gentleman uh, for three years. And I knew he didn't want to have kids. And at the time, I didn't want to have kids. But I knew he was getting ready to propose to me. And I was a little worried because I was like, I think I want kids. So I broke up with him. And I told myself, I always give myself deadlines. I was like, you're going to have, you're just going to be Terry for six months. So, so I didn't do any dating or anything for six months. And then my girlfriend and I were working out during lunchtime at the gym. And finally, the six months was up. I was like, Suzanne, listen. We're going to start working out after work because that's where the guys go that have jobs. They go there after work. <laughs> yeah, you and, want the guys who were there in the middle of the day, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. I was like, I need to find a husband because I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> so I go and I meet Bruce the first day. And Bruce comes up to me. He goes, gosh, you look really familiar. And being me, I was like— Was that a line or was it really— I think it was a line. Okay. He goes, you look really familiar. Where do I know you from? I was like— I'm Asian. We all look alike. And he <laughs> laughed so hard, and he followed me around for two weeks. Um, was he subtle about it, or was he? No, yeah. no, he wasn't subtle. He asked me out, and I told him I had a boyfriend, and and his the first thing that came out of his mouth, well, do you want to do legs tomorrow? And I'm like, usually when I tell someone I have a boyfriend, I don't they see him again. Yeah. Bit, yeah. But he would always, he'd always come in and follow me around and talk to me. And I was like, dang, he's cramping my style. No one else is going to come and say hello. They're going to think he's my boyfriend. Well, it was a Thursday. The second week, it was a Thursday. I was on the elliptical machine, and I'm up there going, good golly, he's going to come in, and he's going to hang out with me the whole time. I'm never, ever going to meet anyone. He didn't come in, and my heart fell. Aww. And I was like, I knew right then I loved him. And the next day, I emailed him, and we've been together ever since. Wow. <laughs> so I wonder if that—did he do that on purpose? No. I, I found out later he took another girl out. Yes. He finally I, gave up on you, I Yes. Guess. I, well, no, he probably didn't give up to, on me, but he probably was interested in another girl also, and he took her out. But he was really interested in me because once I gave him, like, yeah. the okay. That he, was it for the yep, other girl. Yep, and we've been together ever since. That's awesome. And uh, your plan continued to be successful because you have children, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Tell me about them. Yep, my eggs were getting old, so that's why I had to, one, find a husband and hurry up and have a baby. <laughs> so uh, so Bruce and I started dating in March, and in September— March of— Hmm. March of 2014. And uh, in September, um, I pretty much said, listen, I plan on having a baby next year. You need to decide if you're going to be the daddy or not. <laughs> and he's like, well, can you give me till January? And I was like, okay. So in January, we got married. He gave me a ring. And we got married in an attorney's office because I sold my house. And the money that I got from the house, we put into rental property. And this is one of the reasons why Bruce loves me because he'd already been married before. And they spent a lot of money and it didn't work out. So he's like, you want a wedding? And I'm like, no, I want rental property. We're going to take this money and we're going to get rental property because I'm all about making more money. Right. And he just, he's like, oh my gosh, I love you, Terry. And one of my favorite stories. <laughs> a very pragmatic person, right? Yes, you like that. Yes, yes. Yep. And one of my favorite stories is, okay, so growing up, girls think about their weddings and think about the ring, the diamond. Right. I always did. I always wanted a diamond ring. But guys don't. They didn't go, like, ooh, I can't wait to have that little gold band. Can't wait. Can't wait to put it on. So I said, Bruce, listen, I know you don't want a gold band. You actually already have one for your first wedding. So if you want to wear that, that's fine. I want to buy you something that you want. So he wanted a red trailer. And it cost me way more than a band. But he got something he wanted. A red trailer for what? Like what? pulling mean, his big lawnmower. Oh, like, you mean like a little pull behind yeah. that he could load stuff yeah, up on? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I got you. And uh, so I bought him that. It was like $1,400. And I was like, oh, $100 would have been the band, you know? But I got him that. But it's so funny now because I pretty much bought it from him for my business like a couple of years later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking ahead. Yeah. Well, So did you awesome. have children pretty soon after that? So we got married in January, and we decided uh, to go ahead and start trying. And again, Terry always has a plan, and my plan was I was only going to have one child because I was like, I think I got married, I was 34 when I got, no, 35 when we got married. Okay. Yep, I was 35 when we got married, and I was like, I'm probably only going to have one baby. 
So I bought the book on how to determine the sex of your child. So we had to follow. Yeah, those are very reliable. Well, we had to follow that book. And because we followed it, I didn't get pregnant until like July. And the only reason why I got pregnant was because I was watching Kings and Queens and Carrie was trying to get pregnant and she bought an ovulation kit. I was like, wait, there's a kit? I don't even want to ask what that is. Oh, my is. God. It's a sticky pee on it. tells you when you ovulate. Okay, so, I gotcha. So there's a kit. So I found out about it, went and bought it, got pregnant that month, and had a girl. Had a girl. <laughs> did you have any more children? Um, I didn't. No, we didn't have any more kids. But uh, my nephews live with me. I've had them since they were three and four. Okay. And now they are 14 and 15. Oh, awesome. So even Thomas, uh, the younger one, he would go, Mommy, you're my aunt. I'm like, yes, I am. Mm-hmm. That's nice. So you got a, a bigger family mm-hmm. right yep. off the bat. My kids are, right now, my kids are 13, 14, and 15. Wow. So they fit together nicely. Uh-huh. That's, that's great. Um, so but so that probably wasn't part of your plan, right? That was a twist. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot. If you were in my family, there's a lot of twists and turns in my family. So I... And I'm still expecting more twists and turns, mm-hmm. but it's a little bit easier now because I have the funds. Right. And my sister has the funds to help out. Yeah. Tell me about how you got into the wedding or a party rental business. Okay. So I love weddings. I love everything about it. I love the anticipation, the design, the decor, the hustle and bustle, the bride. I just, the emotions. I love crying. I love those like where you want to tear up or you get chill bumps because of that song they're dancing to or something like that. Love weddings. But I didn't have a wedding because I had to hurry up and get married. So we got married in our attorney's office when we were signing paperwork to buy the quadruplex. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I didn't have the wedding of my dreams. So I decided that when my daughter would turn six, I was going to have the biggest party that would also be kind of like my wedding. It would give me that satisfaction. So I waited till she was six and it was 2012. And by that time I had my sons too, or my nephews, and they were seven and eight. So I was like, let's do it all at one big time. Let's have the big blowout. So I rented Goodwood. It's a wedding venue here in Tallahassee. And I wanted everything outside. And the one thing I wanted was chandeliers hanging down from the trees over the cake, the three wedding cakes, AKA birthday cakes. Right. They were in the shape of huge wedding cakes. And each one had its own little personality. So so they were tiered, traditional yes, uh, wedding three cakes. of them. Okay. Uh-huh. Yes. Yep. Um, I wanted chandeliers hanging down. So I looked everywhere for chandeliers I li- I, I, that I would like, and I couldn't find any to rent. So I bought six of them. And I rewired them myself because Bruce taught me how to rewire for a plug. Um, and I hired someone to hang them in the trees over the cake like, table. Like a live oak tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a That big must have been trip. pretty amazing. It was. This wedding cost me a lot of money, and I love everything about it. <laughs> yeah. But I bought a lot of stuff for the party. And uh, after that party, one of my brides who was shooting her wedding, she's like, oh, can can I borrow that chandelier? And I sure, sure. And then her friend saw it, and they, like, contacted me. Can we rent that? And I was like, yes, you sure can. So that's how it started. So I rented the chandeliers out. Oh, it was like hotcakes. And then there was a couple other stuff that I had bought for the party that I rented out. And then I decided to go buy more stuff. And I remember at the time, the first thing I really bought was little ch- kids' shivari chairs. I was like, I might as well start off slow. I'll start off with birthday parties, you know? Right. So I got little kids' shivari chairs. And I remember Diva Bruce going, no one is going to rent that, Terry. I was like, you're right. You're right. No one's going to rent it until I show them that they need to. You know, so I just did a whole style session, like a kid's party, and I took gorgeous pictures. And next thing I know, everybody. And so now my husband goes, I'm never going to doubt you again. (laughs) So, I mean, from that to where you are now, Mm -hmm. you've collected a lot of stuff. Yes, I have a warehouse now. I have probably two, two, four, six, eight. I probably have about 2,000 chairs. So chairs, how, chairs are hot cakes. Yeah. So how do you decide from glass, you know, glassware to, you know, shears, everything, the lights, everything that makes it magic. Right. How do, how do you decide what those good pieces are and how they all fit together? It's just my aesthetics. I just know what I would have in my home. And if I would have it in my home, yeah, I'll buy it. Yeah. It's just, it's, and that's probably one of the things that differentiates me from everyone else because I have my own aesthetics. And so it's like, 
Do I like this floor lamp chandelier? No one had floor lamp chandeliers until I par- purchased two of them from Restoration Hardware for $700 each. And Bruce, again, was like shaking his head. Let me tell you, I made that money back so fast hmm. and more, and I still have them. I just know what I like. I like, I'm not a trendsetter. I don't start trends. I stick with classics and classics that can be done in a modern way. I, I'm a very classical, symmetrical kind of person. I, I love, I want the weddings that I design and create to look good 50 years from now, to go look good 100 years from now. How do you feel when you walk into a blank space, a venue that's empty? When does your mind start going crazy with ideas? And and understanding too, you've talked to the family, the bride, and, mm-hmm. and you understand what kind of they're looking for. Then how how does that go from there? Well, that's just it. It's like, I always want to know, like, how did you guys meet? You know, or how did he propose to you? Or do y'all have a song or a favorite movie? Or what do y'all like to do together? And then I like to take that and incorporate it somehow with um, the wedding. It could be small or it could be big, you know. But uh, I remember one wedding, um, they met, they were high school sweethearts. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. She's like, yeah, I was a ballet dancer and he played on the soccer team. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, what did we bring that in? What? So she brought her, she goes, well, I have ballet slippers, but they're old and raggedy. I was like, even better. <laughs> right. I was like, so we had those on her chair and we had his soccer cleats on his chair. That's awesome. And, you know, yeah. we still add little flowers and stuff, but it was a part of their personality. And then there was another wedding where she was a architecture and she had made all these models for school. And I was like, do you have any of them? Have that as your, like, instead of a gift card box, let's have that as your gift card. Like they can put it in through the doorway. Right. It was just, it's just so much fun to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes, when I walk into a venue, I do get excited about big blank empty canvas. And I get excited when I feel like the, uh, uh, the clients have the same aesthetic style design as I do. And there's no stopping us then. Right. There's no stopping us. Carry in the details, Jedi Masters. Because <laughs> it's got to be interesting because there only there's a limited number of venues, so you end up going to the same places over and over again, but yes. you make it unique every time. We try. We yeah. definitely try. Mm-hmm. But there's, uh, you know, once we do something, there is a certain look that all the brides want, you know? And sometimes, like, there's a chandelier that it's a six-foot wide chandelier that I made um, with wisteria hanging down, and all my brides want it every time it's at Goodwood. And I finally had to retire it. And I'm going to do something even more amazing with it. So watch out. Watch out. Debuting in January. Awesome. So um, tell me about the blueberry farm. Oh, okay. So um, this is this is why America is so great. Because it would not have happened in Vietnam. So here we came to America. We grew up very poor. Sometimes we wore the same clothes. Every other day we'd switch off with the kids, you know, my siblings. Um, sometimes my dad didn't have a job because strikes, I guess union strikes. I remember Mm -hmm. that's when we had government cheese. Um, but because of that, it's made me want to build and be bigger and bigger. So my kids can have a legacy and always have something to look on. And my sister who, who is doing very well for herself, she, um, purchased some land and we're going to create a blueberry farm. And then it's going to also be a venue where people can come on and have celebrations. So hoping that it will be all ready by fall of 2020. We uh, just got the keys last week. And she's already, it's like a big dollhouse to her. She's already started like, okay, I'm going to take out this wall. I've already purchased this. I'm like, awesome. So she like cares about the inside of the house, which is awesome. Um, We have the same taste. So everything she's been picking, I'm in love with. But me, it's all about the outside. I want that French garden, English country, chateau feel look. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's in the Tallahassee area? Yes. Yes. It's like in the north side off Proctor Road. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and you had also mentioned that you're now officially launching wedding planning? And design. And design. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. Yeah. So I've been doing event planning. I mean, I'm sorry, I've been doing wedding rentals since 2012, but I'm happy to say a lot of people like my style and they will call me or they'll ask me to come to a venue and take a look at it and, and for my suggestions. And I love because I love like, oh, I get to have another party. So I've been doing it, you know, on the side for people all the time. And then I finally, you know what? They keep asking for it. Let's give it to them. 
So I announced it last week and at the bridal show that we have officially added event design and planning as part of a service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Is that going to include day of coordination or? Oh, it's so funny you asked that. As of right now, there is no plan for day of coordinating. It's only full planning or partial planning. And, And this may change. You know, like I said, I'll jump out of the plane without knowing how to work the parachute. And on the way down, I may decide like, no, maybe I should pull this string instead of this string. So as of right now, there will be no day of coordinating. And that's because I just want to be more of the process, more of the design element. I want to be more included in that. Uh, for day of coordinating, the bride's already figured everything out. And we were more of like the hustle and bustle and just just show up and place things where she wanted or or you know set up things the way she wanted it or he wanted it. But uh, I just want to be more of the process. So right as of right now, there is no day of coordinating. Okay. So Terry, what do you want people to know most about you? I'm loyal. I'm loyal to people who are loyal to me. I'm not very good with people who are not loyal to me. I have a high turnover rate because <laughs> I can be kind of demanding. But I'm also very giving. I've helped so many, many, I've helped so many people start their own businesses. And, um, and I'm very free with my information. It's probably too free. But what is it about, what do you think it is? I know you say you're demanding and, and high energy and all that stuff. But what do you think makes the difference when for somebody to be successful working with you or not successful working with you? Attention to detail and remembering stuff. Like, here's your piece of paper, load the trailer. And then I show up to the venue and we're unloading. I'm like, where's this table? Did you load it? Oh, I forgot. So that, so my thing is never do anything twice. So they just cost me to do something twice. Now we have to go back to the warehouse, grab it and bring it back here. So my whole philosophy is efficiency. We don't do things twice. And, and I can kind of like, you know, the first time, Okay. Second time, oh, third time, crazy Terry comes out. And that's really hard for me to hold in sometimes. Right. And I, I, I like to use the word passionate instead of crazy. But yes, it does happen. And as I get older, I'm starting to mellow out a little bit. Um, and also, I'm starting to, mm, okay, it's okay. We have to go back to the warehouse. Like, I'm trying to be like that, but it's very hard. Right. Because... I think a lot of people who are very driven expect everyone else to exactly. think the same way and they that, do. And that's, yes, that's the biggest thing. And that's how I, that's so funny you said that because I have to go to myself, Terry, not, I say this to myself, I'll, Terry, not everyone thinks like you do. Not everyone thinks like you do. So learn how but they, they think. But they should, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, but find out how they think and then explain it in a way they'll understand. So, yes, that's one thing. That's so funny you said that. That's one thing. Not everyone thinks like you, Terry. Not everyone thinks like you. So stop it. <laughs> right. <laughs> one, um, one thing or person that really changed or altered the trajectory of your life at some point. Oh, yeah. I know exactly when that was. Sixth grade. Uh, yeah. I believe I was 11 or 12. And, um, okay, so I'm very confident. I'm very forceful. But I wasn't always like that. I was really shy and quiet. And I was a doormat and people walked all over me. And then I remember riding on the school bus in Moultrie, going home to Funston on a dirt road. It was sixth grade. And I, I'm very perceptive. And I said, Terry, it's your own fault. Half the solution is knowing what the problem is. And I realized it's you, Terry. So that day I decided, like, I don't want any more friends. I don't care. So anyone that has borrowed money from me, the next day I was like, you owe me money. Because I was the type that didn't eat lunch because I lent my money to someone. Hmm. And, and I stopped doing that. And, and that has changed my life. I was uh, picked on. I wouldn't say I was bullied because um, everyone says that now. But there was a couple of kids that would pick on me. And I went off on them. And it got to the point where no matter what, I was going to fight you. I didn't care if I got beaten down or killed. I was going to fight you. And because of that attitude, no one fought me. And and that, they, they had to be surprised at first, right? Like all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, they would. I mean, okay, so growing up very poor in Moultrie, people would pick on you because of your clothes or the way you look or the house that you lived on. And uh, and and that's what and happened. Plus, you didn't look like most of the other kids, so exactly. that was another oh, element. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That that's exactly what happened. And so, I I allowed it to happen. And then one day, the next day, riding on that school bus, I it's not going to happen anymore. And it didn't. Um, I made a conscious effort, and it worked. Um, yeah, I'm pretty proud of myself for that. That was one big moment in my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, there is one thing that I have to say. I got two degrees from FSU. My biggest regret in life was going to college. Really? I Every day, I wish I'd never gone to college. Um, Why col- is that? College basically teaches you how to work for other people. Um, you know, of course you need college if you're going to be a doctor or engineer or vet or something like that. But a lot of people go to college to figure out what they want to do. I wish some, because my whole life is, it was like, I always heard if you want to make money, which that was my whole goal in life was to go to college. You want to make money, make sure you go to college. And that's why I did it. I wish someone's like, you know what? You know, there's a Votech school. Maybe you can learn woodworking or you can learn photography. Or honestly, I wish I'd, you know, left college and went and worked for a real estate firm, maybe cleaning their garbage cans, anything like that. And being around people who were like flipping houses or purchasing this and selling it. I wish I was around that. Uh, Again, I spent too much money and too much time studying in college. Hmm. So, Well, there's a big push now toward um, technical education, certificates. And if you Um, work for me, that's my biggest thing. It's like I tell them, it's like, you don't need college. Right. Why do you need college? The idea is that a four-year university experience is not for everybody. Everybody should get some kind of training after high school, but that can take a, on a lot of different Get looks. training while in high school. Yep. Find out what you want to do while in high school. Yep. And the money will come. So the name of the podcast is How I Got Here. Mm-hmm. And so we're talking about how you got to this point in your life. Where do you think here might be in three to five years from now? Take over Terry. <laughs> You're going to find something new to take over? You know what my dream really is? Well, I have lots of dreams, but one of them is I want to be the next Pottery Barn. I want to be, my last name is Smith and my husband's last name is Gordon. I didn't take his name, um, but I told him, you're the only man I'd ever change my name for. And he'd be like, Terry, you keep that unique last name of yours. (laughs) That's That's why I love him. That's why he's so perfect for me because he allows me to be me. And um, so I, I, instead of Pottery Martin, I would love to have Smith Gordon. I, I want to find items that I'm totally in love with and recreate it and offer it. That's, I'd like to be, yeah, I'd like to be a furniture store. <laughs> well, I, I don't doubt you could do it if you wanted it, to do it. It may not be in three to five years, but that is my dream. And uh, so right now we're going to con- concentrate on uh, the Blueberry Farm, Sienna Lee Gardens is going to be the name of it. And and keep growing the rental business and the event designing and planning side of it. That was Terry Smith. Her big personality and determination have taken her a long way, and I certainly wouldn't doubt her ability to accomplish any dream she sets her mind to. So someday if you're furnishing your home from a Smith Gordon store, remember you heard it here first. Thanks for listening to the show. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. It really does make a difference. Thanks to my amazing staff at Fiori Communications, who pick up the slack while I'm working on these podcasts, and to Troy Bloom for composing our theme music. You can hear more of Troy's creations on Facebook and Instagram at Troy Bloom Music. To connect with the podcast or suggest a future guest, follow us on social media or email us at podcast at fioricommunications.com.